你好，很高兴认识你。嗯、um, ，Yeah, wow, this is a big room. So、uh, I've come today to talk to you a little bit about two subjects.、Um, so it's sort of two talks welded together,、um, a little bit disjoint, but、um, I think the first one is kind of important, but it's kind of short. So when I when I speak、um, uh, these days, I tend not to like to decide what I will speak about until pretty close to the point that I actually go ahead and speak. Um, this is、uh, this often earns the ire of the organisers of these events because they they like to have all of the presentations queued up days if not weeks before, and mine tends to come along minutes or hours before.、Um, I made my mind up about what I wanted to speak、uh, about today when I、uh, looked at the uh, website um, for this event maybe 36 hours ago. And、uh, I, I, I scanned down the list of the various talks and speakers,、um, and I, I found a number of times like Web three was mentioned. It's like, ah,、oh, that's good.、Yeah. Um, and I found once or twice、uh, the, the word trust was mentioned, and、uh, I found this to be、uh, somewhat disappointing. And、um, the first talk is explaining why I found this to be disappointing.、Um, So it's about trust and truth. Now, I don't know how well this talk is going to translate into、uh, Chinese.、Um, I don't know if there are two nicely equivalent words. There's a good English Chinese、uh, dual language speaker. Can can you answer that question? Are these two words in Chinese actually fundamentally different concepts? Yes. Anyone listening? Yeah. Yeah. Okay.、Um, but you know, hope, so hopefully it will translate somewhat into、uh, into Chinese. I looked at the definitions for these two words because I don't like you know sort of harping on about you know how I like terminology to be used unless I've at least got some vague、uh, claim to accuracy、um, with with you know dictionary and pre-existing authorities. So trust is is really about. Um, I would say it's actually quite similar to faith, right? It's、uh, it's about one's、um, how much one really believes in some other person or group of people, organisation. It's very much a human-oriented concept. I might trust another person to do a job for me. I might trust the bank, for example, to look after my money. But in in both of those cases, it's a human or a human organisation that I'm trusting. It's very odd to say something like, "I trust physics." I trust that the sun will come up tomorrow. That's not a phrase that we use very much. It doesn't really make sense, yeah, because. We're so certain that the sun will come tomorrow. We're so certain about the laws of physics that we don't really point out that we trust them anymore. We just assume that they are true, and that's why truth comes in. Truth isn't about human relationships, right? Truth is simply about a description of the universe, a description of our world. And normally, in order to come to a description that we all agree on, we talk about well, we use concepts like logic, rationality. We appeal to the rationalism of the other person that we're trying to convince, that we are trying to talk with. Evidence is another useful one, and you know these are kind of quite sciencey things because science ultimately is a very Process-oriented means to come and find the truth. We can agree on the truth together by using the process of science. And using the truth, we can describe the world, but also we can manipulate the world. The truth empowers us to manipulate the world. So I looked for two pictures, and these two seem to be reasonable depictions of the concepts that I wanted to get across. With trust, 
there is one or more other people involved. And in order for us to survive, or at least get, get the job done, or understand the situation, we have to assume that they will act benevolently. They will act in our interest. That's what the trust is. That's how trust works. We have faith, or we believe. We might not have any real reason to believe that they will act benevolently. We just sort of hope and believe. Truth, on the other hand, is rather different. In that case, we take matters into our own hands. We inspect the world, we analyze the world. We use, we draw upon models and principles that we already sort of believe to be um, a reasonable way of predicting how things will go. We use evidence, we verify, we appeal to rationalism. These are all ways how we manipulate and interact with the world directly. And if we don't use that, then basically we're going to fail in what we want to do, or we'll have to be very, very lucky. So these are two fundamentally different ways of achieving a goal. One is basically you delegate the goal to somebody else that you trust. The other is that you take matters into your own hands, and you just go ahead and do it yourself. Trust versus truth. So where does crypto economics fit into this? Well, crypto economics is probably just a, a, a sort of slightly fake term in that it's mostly just economics, but let, let, let's be nice and say crypto economics. Well, these are the theorems and the models and the axioms, axioms to help us model the world, particularly the world of humans and human economic interactions. How can we, what are the principles that we can draw upon in order to create systems that work purely <coughs> from the fact that they of, of their design of their mechanisms yeah so that we don't have to trust any individual actor or set of actors to actually behave benevolently towards us rather the system itself delivers the correct results regardless of those actors or how malevolent they may be so this is the subject to allow us to create and verify and prove the system. And if we, if we say trust minimizing, then it's basically we're talking about these systems. We're talking about the systems that allow us to not have to trust anyone inside. Yeah? It's not that we are creating systems that are trustworthy, it's quite the opposite. We are creating systems that work correctly regardless of trust. And if we talk about trust-bound systems or trusted systems, then that means systems that can break because somebody acts malevolently. They are systems that are not reliable in the face of trustlessness, in the face of malevolent, non-benevolent, entities. In trust-bound systems, we often don't really know who it is that we're going to be dealing with. They might be distant. They might, their identities might be unknown. They might be unaccountable. There may be no real means of verifying that what they've done is correct. This is all the case with banks, for example. There may be very little opportunity for us to choose between which system and which entity it is that we have to place our trust in. And we may be unable to actually get a job done unless we do trust in one. Trustworthy, then, is a bit of a nonsense concept. It's just a nice term to make you feel better about having to trust somebody. Rather than making trustworthy organizations, entities, we should be concerned in removing trust from the equation altogether. Trustworthiness, trustworth, whatever that word is, is not the same as truth. 
Now, of course, no system is 100% trust-free, truthful, though elements of maths and science come close. And no system is 100% trust-bound either. We normally have some reasonable, vaguely rational reason to use something rather than something else. Although, you know, religion can get pretty close to being 100% trust-bound. It is a continuum. And most systems that we trust to do something for us or get something done um, exist somewhere on this continuum. And I've, I've labeled a few of them. Um, you can take a picture of this slide and go home and on some uh, contemplative evening maybe label some other things in your life. Uh, but I think it's important to understand where things do fall on this and be honest about it. Because ultimately, if you, if you really if you really put something on the level of truth when actually it's it, it's trust, then you're going to be uh, you're going to potentially open yourself to problems that you really um, didn't expect. Okay, so this is the first talk. I hope that's been somewhat illuminating. This is more my my more philosophical talk of the two. The second talk is um, more uh, practical. Um, so Polkadot is a project that I've been working on for two or three years now. Um, this is a very uh, brief um, sort of overview. So what is Polkadot? Polkadot is, uh, if you're not familiar, a network of networks. And eventually, it will be a network of networks of networks of networks and so on. Um, in other words, it's composable. It's designed and built to be composable. Um, put another way, Polkadot is a platform, a platform for blockchain innovators, a platform for people who want to create new uh, pieces of business logic that would roughly be, um, roughly be compared to what blockchain would do uh, today, and uh, introduce it into a system whereby it, can, uh, uh, it wouldn't suffer from typical network effects that, uh, or lack thereof that blockchains uh, and launching your own specifically would do these days. And as such, it secures, it draws in um, uh, security from all of the other chains on Polkadot and also connects your chain to all of the other facilities that already exist on Polkadot in a way that is uh, very uh, efficient, performative. And uh, unlike um, uh, Spark contract platforms, at least the ones that I know, uh, this one's actually Turing complete, although I would, uh, I think it's best not to test that. Uh, but, uh, you know, Ethereum and so on, for, uh, for example, are not really Turing complete because they have gas, which prevents you from executing a program um, of, uh, of sufficiently long. Anyway. So what, uh, what are the product offerings of Polkadot? What does it actually do? What does it give you? Um, there are three main product offerings that will be um, available at launch or thereabouts. Uh, split into uh, parachain, parachain offerings, uh, parathread uh, offerings, and the bridge offerings. And they, um, they each allow you to do roughly the same thing. They each allow you to take a blockchain um, and sort of plug it in, connect it to Polkadot, the uh, uh, trust-free superhighway. And uh, whereas parachains, uh, they basically come at different costs and, um, and, and, uh, and, and feature sets. So the three different bits of feature um, that are important are security, connectivity, and the, the time that it takes for you to, uh, uh, or the minimum time that you can uh, uh, pass between two blocks. So if you uh, have a parachain, then the time, minimum time is six seconds, which is runs in lockstep with the Polkadot uh, main relay network. Um, and it has very effective connectivity and, uh, and security. Security is the maximum security protocol to deliver, which is to say it's basically as secure as the main Polkadot relay chain. And it will connect very quickly, it will pass messages between those um, different uh, blockchains that exist on it, which we call parachains, um, uh, very fast. 
power threads are more or less the same, except it's pay as you go, right? So rather than paying um, a fairly large deposit up front to have your chain exist, you uh, you pay a very small deposit, and um, and yeah. And, uh, and, and then from there on, every time that you want to progress in your chain, every time you want to push forward an extra block, there's a, um, an additional fee. Very similar to how um, smart contracts sort of charge fees, except in this case, the fee is paid by the chain itself, so the economic, economics are slightly different, rather than the users. Bridges allow you to do your own, um, your own thing, right? You can uh, find your own validators, Secure your own chain. Um, they, for bridges, it really just provides connectivity. Now, because Polkadot can't trust your bridge validators, um, we have to wait a little bit longer before we relay messages over. Because once the messages are relayed, they're irrevertible. You can't take them back, right? So there has to be, in much the same way that an exchange won't accept your funds if, if, uh, until there's a specific number of confirmations. It's the same with bridges, basically. But the nice thing about bridges is you get a bit more freedom, particularly for your block time. So your block time can be very, very small if you want. It can be like a second or half a second, whatever you like. Secure bridges are something that will come in later um, in the Polkadot timeline, uh, hopefully not too much later than Genesis. Uh, but these allow a fairly high degree of security based around Polkadot, uh, but also give you very similar freedoms to the bridge. And this is something that we'll be using in order to nest polka dots inside of other polka dots. So parathreads are fully interoperable with parachains, same API, do the same coding, it's really just the differences in terms of um, the payments. Yeah? With parachains it's up front, with parathreads it's a pay as you go. You can switch between them, and here's a sort of an overview of, of, of like where all the blocks fit in. So, parachains and parathreads can kind of switch between each other. Maybe uh, once you get the, um, uh, once, you've, once you've been on a parathread for a while and you've got lots of users, you might then want to decide, hey, actually I want to change it to a parachain and have like um, much more frequent progressions, much more uh, sort of uh, heavy due to usage. In that case, you would sort of buy a parachain slot off an existing parachain. Um, or one of the new ones that come up for auction. There's a parachain, maybe that you're, um, maybe you don't need the six-second block times anymore. You're happy to sort of start retiring, move it to a parathread, in which case you could swap with a parathread, or however you like to do it. Now, parathreads can also then move into bridge chains and eventually secure bridges as well, and backwards and forwards. So, really, these four product offerings, three product offerings, four to come, will be. Um, uh, sort of spot swappable, interchangeable, as your needs change. Roughly speaking, on the relay chain, there's going to be space for, we would hope, around 100 um, different parachains or uh, sort of independent blockchains to be executed and progressed per block. Some of these will be leased slots, a parachain um, product, as before. Some of them will be system level things, including bridge hubs, bridges, and the rest will be uh, fed into a parathread pool for per block auctioning parathreads. So basically this just allows different parathreads to be scheduled, um, different sets of parathreads in different blocks. Again, very similar to how um, smart contract economics work, except it's the chain that's paying for the computation, not each individual user. So your users don't need to hold dots to use your parathread. In summary, parathreads have all the security and connectivity. The relay chain, they, they act, they get all the benefits of that being on the relay chain. Um, but it does mean that retiring chains can stay alive as indefinitely as long as they want. There is no sort of instant death after a parachain um, uh, no longer has a slot. Um, every development team can use the relay chain now, just by having a parachain. There's obviously now an on-ramp as well as an off-ramp, and um, you get to uh, a bit more flexible payment options. That is the end of the talk. I hope you found it informative. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you.